Let me start by uh, sort of giving a brief overview of what we did yesterday. Uh, so the question we wanted to address can be simply stated as when does an analog of Semmerdich's theorem hold in a random graph, uh, sorry, in a random set? So here we choose a set R uniformly at random from the collection of all subsets of the first n integers, which contain m integers. And there was a fairly simple uh, argument which said that it cannot be true if m is not at least n to the power k minus 2 divided by k minus 1. So answer, certainly no. if m is much smaller than n to k minus 2 divided by k minus 1. And the rough argument was that in a typical such set, the number of arithmetic progressions is so small that by deleting just, say, 1% of the elements, we can delete them all. So, of course, there will be massive sets with no k-term arithmetic progressions. Now, there was a general approach to this to such questions, uh, developed by Conlon and Gowers, and independently by Matthias Schacht, uh, who considered this problem in a much more general framework. So here we had some uniform hypergraph H. On on some finite set V. And in our case, this uniform hypergraph was just the collection of all k-term arithmetic progressions in N, and V was just the set 1 through N. And Semredi's theorem in this language says that the independence number of this hypergraph, so the maximum number of, of elements we can take in a subset of V so that it doesn't contain any k-term arithmetic progression, is little o of N. So this is the k term APs in N. Now what Conlon and Gowers and Schacht did was uh, analyzed the independence number of a hypergraph, of subhypergraph of H, which is induced by a random set of vertices, which corresponds to our problem. We want to choose some random subset of the integers, look at the arithmetic progressions there, and see uh, what is the largest set which doesn't contain any of them. So Conlon, Gowers, and Schacht, what they showed is that if M is sufficiently large and we take R again to be a uniformly <coughs> chosen random subset of the vertex set V, then the independence number of the subhypergraph of H induced by R scales appropriately. So it will be around M divided by the size of V times alpha of H. And the error here will be plus minus little o of M. So the methods they used were, were quite different. Different here it was um, a method called the multiple exposure. And here they used an approach which was discussed by Tammy Ziegler on, on Monday. But looking at this, looking at this equality, so the uh, lower bound here is, is, is pretty much trivial because it's enough to fix a particular set of size alpha of h in a typical set which will have roughly this intersection with the set. So the game here is to prove an appropriate upper bound. And one so one idea how to prove such an upper bound is just by saying, OK, let's look at the collection of all independent sets of this size. Each of them appears with very small probability. So if we are able to show that there's not too many of them or too many different ones, then we can apply some sort of a union bound argument. So 
Another idea is count independent sets of size about m over v times alpha of h and use the union bound. So such very naive approach doesn't work for all sorts of problems, but whenever this is satisfied, whenever the independence number is, uh, is little of the number of vertices, then this approach indeed holds. And this is what happens in the setting of Semradi's theorem. So our goal last time was to prove the following theorem uh, for every k at least 3 and positive beta. Uh, there, there is a constant c such that if m is at least a large constant times n to k minus 2 divided by k minus 1, then the number of sets A of size m among the first n integers, which don't contain a k term AP, this is at most a beta to the n proportion of all sets. So this is a sub-exponentially, sorry, beta to the m, proportion sub-exponentially small subfamily of all sets on m elements. And so f from here, from this statement, was very, very easy to, to derive the random statement we're interested in. So let me just remind you briefly the proof. So the corollary was that if m uh, is at least so if, yes, a, m is at least some large constant times n to k minus 2 divided by k minus 1, uh, then uh, the probability that this random set R, so here R is again a uniformly randomly chosen set of size m among the first n integers, the probability that R uh, contains a AP free K AP free set with delta M uh, elements. This was exponentially small in M. And what was the idea? Well, we just counted the sets which contain a large K term AP free subset. So proof was count the bad sets using the bound from the theorem. Right, so this probability, so among all n choose m sets, we need to choose, enumerate the bad ones. So if a set is bad, it means it contains a subset of size delta m, which belongs to this family. And the number of choices here uh, is n choose delta m multiplied by this very, very tiny factor. So it's n choose delta m times beta to the m. And then the remaining elements we just choose arbitrarily. So it's n minus delta m. 1 minus delta m, and this is equal to beta to the m uh, times m it choose, choose delta m. And now, uh, if we choose beta to be much smaller than delta, then this will be exponentially small in m. Right, this is some exponential in m, uh, so this is 2 to m times the binary entropy uh, of delta, and this function goes to uh, 0, sorry, this is b, 
beta to delta m, because we're selecting a set of size delta m, and this goes to uh, to zero as as delta as delta tends to zero. Um, sorry, we actually we need something something slightly stronger. We need to show uh, that. So if we multiply this, it will be uh, e to delta m times log beta a minus uh, h. Sorry, plus h. H of delta divided by delta, uh, and now we just need to show that S delta tends to zero. This term will tend to zero, and this term will will dominate. Uh, so, sorry, modulo these computations, which I now messed up. Um, this statement is a fairly easy consequence of, of this particular bound. So today, I'll, uh, I'll convince you that this, this bound is true. And we'll derive this bound from the characterization of independent sets in the hypergraph of arithmetic progressions. So uh, we'll derive it from a much more general statement, which was proved by Yorji Balok, Robert Morris, and myself, and independently from, by David Saxon and Andrew Thomason. So let me remind you what the statement was. So the very rough statement Roughly speaking, if we have any uniform hypergraph, so say here H is k uniform, then the collection of all independent sets in H, these are independent sets in H, may be covered by a small collection of almost independent sets. So this is this is the rough idea, and why is such a, why is such a statement useful? Uh, because now, in order to count all the independent sets, uh, since this family is really really small, it's enough to count the independent sets contained in each of the almost independent sets. So this will be so small that actually summing over all these these containers will just give a negligible uh, sort of a negligible increase in the count. And roughly, the number of independent sets will be more or less equal to the number of subsets of each of these almost independent things. And then there will be another part of the argument, which will be specific to the problem. We have to characterize these almost independent sets in order to give any meaningful bound. In the case of Semmerdi's theorem, we already proved last time there was this average, averaging argument uh, on, the, uh, on the circle which proved that deduced from Semmerdi's theorem that every subset of the first n integers, which contains only very few, less than quadratically many arithmetic progressions, has to be of size small constant times n. So by an averaging argument using Sebradi's theorem, uh, if, if H uh, is the collection of K term arithmetic progressions, then 
almost independent implies size is little o of n. And now, uh, to conclude this theorem, I mean, we have a small collection of these. So we want to count all independent sets. Now, uh, let's enumerate them. For each one, we know it's contained in, in one of these elements of this small collection. So we just multiply by their number. And each of them uh, is contained in this almost independent set. So we know that the size of the set is little o of n. So the number of subsets of it will be little o of n choose m. And this will, this will conclude the bound. So the details maybe are a bit more intricate, but this is, this is the rough idea. Now, so, so this proof has two parts. This characterization part, which just depends on the problem itself, and the fact that such a phenomenon occurs, uh, it's, it's a general phenomenon which, which depends only on uh, sort of the, the distribution or the uniformity of, of degrees in, in this hypergraph age. So uh, let, me, let me restate the theorem which implies this. So maybe let's hide this for later. So the theorem says the following. For every given uniformity, k, uh, a constant c and a, con a constant epsilon, which will here denote the precision, uh, we have a constant c such that the following, the following holds. We take any uniform hypergraph H. H is a k-uniform hypergraph. And F is, an in, is a family of subsets of, of the vertex set of H uh, with the following property. For every subset A in F, the number of edges that this hypergraph has in A is at least an epsilon proportion of everything. So you can think that F contains sets that are not almost independent. Now, uh, furthermore, we, ass we assume that for some some number p between 0 and 1, uh, we have <coughs> the following conditions. For every L between 1 and k, uh, if we look at the maximum number of edges that a single set of, of L vertices can be contained in, this does not exceed this constant that we've chosen here times p to the power l minus 1 times e of h divided by v of h. So right now, um, I will not explain uh, why these conditions are necessary. So maybe just a few comments. If we, f uh, if we here input l equals 1, then it says that the maximum degree is at most a constant times, times the average degree. So it means that this graph is not very far from being regular. And the other conditions say something about the distribution of edges. I mean, they say that you cannot have a small set which contains too many edges. And this is, um, I mean, this depends on, the par on this parameter p. This condition becomes much harder and harder to satisfy the smaller p gets. So uh, it's easier to satisfy when, for example, when p is equal 1, then then this only depends on, on the value for L equals 1, because if the 1 degree is at most the average degree, then all the other degrees are as well. 
So how does this constant P come into play? This constant P uh, will quantify the notion of small here. So uh, the conclusion is that uh, suppose that these conditions are satisfied, then there will exist a family which we call S. This will be a family of subsets of the vertex set which contain at most a P proportion of all the vertices. So this is the small family which will enumerate these covering sets for, for the family of independent sets. And uh, now we, we will quantify what, what covering means. So there is, this f there is this function f, which for every element of the cover tells you what the covering set is. So as I said, these covering sets are almost independent. Uh, and since f is a family of sets which are not almost independent, then this covering function will just map each element of the cover to something which is almost independent, which is not in this family f. Now, there's also a function g, which will tell you for every independent set to which cover uh, it, it, is, it belongs. So it will map i of h to, to the set S. So now we take an independent set, we get some, some label, and then to this label, we already earlier assigned some almost independent set. So this, uh, this set i will be contained in f of g of i. So for all i in i of h, the set i is contained in f of g of i. This is only very roughly for technical reasons. Uh, we will also we require this is this can be proved that the, the every set is labeled by a subset of itself. And once we know that this subset is in i, then the remainder of i can only fit in something which depends on this g of i. Okay, so let's uh, let's maybe look at it again. Um, so, so let me uh, maybe I'll erase something. Let me draw a larger picture. So again, let's draw this power set of V. Here's the set V. Here's the empty set. And somewhere here, we have the collection of, of independent sets. These are, these are sets which are small in this, in this power set. Now, somewhere here, we have this collection F. These are subsets on which in which the hypergraph has many edges. So say these are sets which contain many arithmetic progressions. These are sets which contain no arithmetic progressions. And these are sets which contain, which are almost independent. They don't contain many, but maybe, maybe they contain some. Now here, on the very bottom, we have this tiny collection, because we will think that P is small, tiny collection S of, of labels. And now each label is mapped by by this function f to something which lies below f. It's not necessarily independent, but it's not far from independent. So this is f of s. These are almost independent. Now, and what is the property? Um, if we look at any i, i is mapped by this function g, this labeling function, to some, some subset, which, which is down here. And this, this set was already earlier mapped to a member of, of this small family of almost independent sets. And this happens in such a way that i will be sandwiched between g of i and f of g of i. So in other words, 
if we look at the values of all subsets of the sets here, then they will cover this entire thing. Because every set is below something here. So this is the, this is the idea. Uh, and uh, now let me show, uh, yes. Uh, no, no, it's, a, it's actually it's a very good question. This collection F can only contain so many of them, right? Because this, I mean, this function F assigns to each of these labels some set, and the collection of labels is extremely tiny. I mean, here we have this, this power set of N, which contains 2 to the N elements. And you can say, I mean, if, if this hypergraph is, has many edges, then a typical subset of it is not, uh, is not independent. And now, this is a collection, say, of subsets of size at most n to two-thirds. So it's really, really tiny compared to this. I mean, if, if, if this picture was to scale, then here I should just put you know, a tiny, tiny, tiny dot. Uh, 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 Oh, you mean meant curly F. Uh, sorry, so can you, can you repeat your question again? <laughs> no, so it, okay. Uh, okay, it's, it's another very good question. Um, so, of course, somehow, you would like the collection F to contain all the sets which are not almost independent. Uh, but, uh, and, but we can only, so, so somehow it's very hard to describe the collection of all sets which are not independent. So for example, for the K-term arithmetic progressions, there is no sort of necessary and sufficient condition. But this, uh, in applications, this F will be something which approximates this family from inside, right? If, for example, if we know that something meets the condition for F, it, it means it's not almost independent. Uh, and then, this, uh, this characterization will be meaningful enough so that if we know that something is not in F, then we can say something about this. So, for example, in the setting of K-term arithmetic progressions, we take F to the family of all large sets, and we know that each such set is not almost independent, but maybe there are other sets which are not large and still contain uh, many arithmetic progressions. Yes. Uh, you could, I mean, uh, does this make sense? So you could make this statement in a non-individual fashion. Uh, so just there is this small set of shadow contained without the Fs and the Gs. Uh, yes. So, so this is this is this is true. And for it's for a yeah, it's a weaker statement. For some applications, this is sufficient. Uh, but for some applications in uh, in random graphs, say, if you don't know that. So let, maybe let me explain it uh, on an example. Say we want to tr prove uh, the random version of Turan's theorem, Mantel's theorem, that the largest subgraph of GNP contains only half the edges. Now, uh, the, how, how the proof will go, we will just want to say, OK, each triangle-free graph is contained in one of these sets in the collection. So we take the union bound. If, and if we know that GNP doesn't intersect any of the sets here in more than half the edges, then then we already uh, derive the conclusion. But the problem is that if we had to enumerate over all of them, uh, then uh, this union bound would be too large to work at the threshold. Uh, and instead, if we know that this labeling function is a subset of, of the set in question, then we have the additional condition that the label itself must appear in GNP. So instead of somehow enumerating over all these labels, uh, which are subsets of the entire graph Kn, we just enumerate over the labels which are already subsets of, of this random subgraph, and this saves us a lot. So this is where, where this comes into play. In Semmerdi's theorem, actually, I think it doesn't, but in these random applications, it does. So it's a technical condition which we just get for free from the proof, the way that it's, the theorem is proved, but actually it's, uh, it's pretty useful. No, of, of course. Yeah, I can, <coughs> I can say that, yes, somehow uh, it's just, 
sort of in applications for convenience anyway, we need to define some collection which approximates F, so we did it uh, in the theorem. But, but here, of course, it's, it's best to, to replace F by F, say, F epsilon, which is just the collection of all subsets of V, such that the number of edges induced by A is at least epsilon times E of H. So this is the optimal family you, you have to take here. And every family F which satisfies this condition is clearly contained here. So this is the, the optimal choice. But the, I mean, this, so the idea was that it's very difficult to understand this family, whereas you can give some sufficient conditions uh, defining this family. OK, so let's, let's try to now prove the theorem. What should I erase? Okay, let me maybe erase this. Now, what we did uh, yesterday is two things. We, s we said that the family F, which is the collection of all subsets with at least uh, delta, delta n elements, uh, works, satisfies the condition. So this was, there was this average, averaging argument. And the second was that if I If I denote this condition by star, then we prove that star is satisfied when P is equal to N to minus 1 over K minus 1, which means that this collection S will be some collection of sets of size up to uh, n to the power k minus 2 divided by k minus 1. So hence, S contains only sets of size some constant, which will depend on epsilon uh, times n to k minus 2 divided by k minus 1. I mean, this is not, this is not an accident, because this is the trivial necessary condition for such a theorem to hold, but it's, it, just, it just tells you that the fact that you can just delete one element from each arithmetic progression, this is somehow the bottleneck which, pr uh, which prevents the other statement from, from being true. So once these two things are, are established, uh, then we can already derive, uh, derive the theorem. Uh, so let me let me do this. So proof. We count all k term AP free sets with uh, m, which is greater than constant times n to k minus two, k minus one elements. So for this constant C here, uh, I will take something which is much, much larger than this constant, say larger by a factor of 1 over epsilon squared. So C will be, say, the C epsilon divided by, by epsilon squared. Uh, OK, so we want, to use, we want to use the theorem. And now, what does it mean that this family F works? It means that any member of this family will contain some epsilon n squared arithmetic progressions. So by, by our lemma, uh, for every A and F, the number of edges 
number of arithmetic progressions in A is at least epsilon n squared. So this is the epsilon that I can now input into the theorem. So input epsilon into theorem. We get this constant C epsilon uh, and this collection. And this collection S, which contains sets of size at most C epsilon times n2 k minus 2 divided by k minus 1. Now, how do we use this collection? Well, to count all these, these sets, it's enough to count uh, the subsets in every f and just sum over all uh, elements of, of s. So, now in order to count all subsets which no k-term arithmetic progression and exactly m elements. So here we let m to be at least this constant c now and to k minus 2 divided by k minus 1. So I want to count these sets. And this is equal to the sum over all s in s. So each of these sets gets mapped to one of the elements of s. So for each s separately, I will count the ones which were mapped to this particular s. So this is the number of i, <coughs> ihm, such that g of i is equal to s. Now, what do I know about this family? Let's look at the condition. if. If i was mapped to, to this g of i, then it means that i is contained in f of g of i union g of i, which means that i minus g of i is contained in this set. So here, i minus g of i, and this g of i is equal to s, is contained in f, in f of s. And what do we know about this set f of s? Well, f of s is not in our family f. And our family f is a family of all sets which contain a positive proportion of the elements. So it means that the cardinality of the set is at most delta m. Sorry, delta n. And now, already with this knowledge, I get a really, really good bound on their number because uh, since this set S can be of size at most C epsilon times N to K minus 2 over K minus 1, and the sets I'm counting have, have size some much larger constant C times N to K minus 2 minus K minus 1, which means that this set S is tiny in comparison with M. So most elements of, of i will be chosen from a set of size delta n instead of from a set of size n. So this is at most the sum over all s from 0 to c epsilon n to k minus 2 divided by k minus 1. Now, we have to we have to choose the label. We, we have no control over them. We just know that they're of at most this size. So I sum over all sizes the number of ways to choose this label S. And now um, I know that the set F of S is at most delta n elements, so the remaining m minus S elements will be chosen from here. So now it's a, it's a, fairly, it's a fairly simple uh, calculation. So we bound, uh, we bound this. So this is sum from S0 uh, to 
C epsilon n k minus 2 divided by k minus 1 by E n over S to the S. And this is at most m uh, divided by delta n minus m raised to the power s times delta n choose n. Uh, how I get this? Sure. So. Uh, I want to apply the theorem, and the theorem tells you, you give me a k, and you give me an epsilon, and you give me some constant c which is implicit in here, because we just want the, this maximum degree to be bounded by a constant times something, and with this particular p. And the theorem, what, what it spits out, it spits out this collection s, uh, and this collection s is parameterized by, by this constant c epsilon, so this is the the constant in front of p times times n, which gives a bound on, on the size. So I get, uh, I get this here. Uh, and here, I mean, this is, this is the main term. Uh, I, just, I just need to bound, uh, bound that. Um, so we can here assume that m is smaller than, say, delta n over 2. Because if we're trying to count sets, I mean, there are no k-term AP free sets of size larger de than delta n over 2 by Semmerdi's theorem. So this is uh, at most, I have E times M divided by S uh, and divided by delta n minus M, which is at least delta n over 2. These two n's will cancel. So this is 2EM <coughs> uh, over uh, delta s to the s. And now, such, such functions are increasing in s. So again, this is at most, the largest it can get is, is at the top here, but this is still a tiny proportion of, of m. So this is at most 2em divided by delta times, say, epsilon m raised to the power epsilon m. Uh, which is just some, some constant to the power epsilon m. So I have that this is at most d to the power epsilon m times delta n to the m. And delta n to the m is at most 1 half to the power m times 2 delta n choose m. And even if I stick here this d to epsilon m, then if I make epsilon sufficiently small, then this will be smaller than 1. Yeah, sorry about the, co so the computations are kind of messy, unfortunately. Um, the binomial coefficients are not so easy to work with, at least I don't know of any clean, uh, clean way to, to express it. Maybe if you want to sort of convince yourself that this is true, uh, maybe the most sort of, uh, natural way to do it is to denote this by, say, f of s. No, don't use it. Oh, sorry, not f, yes. Uh, not g. Yeah. <laughs> not g phi. OK. So if this is a phi of, of s, then one can easily compute phi of s plus 1 divided by phi of s, and then use a telescopic product because you know that phi of 0 is just delta n choose m. And then you just show that uh, if you increase s not too much, then this, this doesn't grow too much. So th I, this I would recommend to, to maybe check it, uh, check it at home. Uh, OK, so uh, I hope it was clear enough. But maybe if you have some questions, then I'll be happy to, to answer. So I mean, here you just have to take a leap of faith and believe me that I didn't cheat you with these computations. But the, I mean, the idea is that we choose, say, 
1% from a set of size n and 99% from a set of size delta n. So it's, all, it's not much different than choosing from everything from a set of size delta n. OK, if there are no questions, then let me move to, to the next topic. Uh, and the nec next topic will be another application of, of containers theorem, but now to a somewhat different question, to the question of characterizing graphs which don't contain a fixed subgraph H. And maybe just to make things uh, more concrete, let's for throughout, the, I mean, throughout the lecture assume that the, graph, uh, the forbidden graph H is a triangle, I mean, because somehow this is the most studied case. Maybe some things I'll, I'll write in, in terms of general age because somehow they're just, uh, it's easier to think of them in, in wider generality. But the, the example to keep in mind is when age is a triangle. So goal is we fix a graph age. So we think it's the triangle. The only actually restriction on the graph H <coughs> is that it is not bipartite. So when H is bipartite, this is a completely different problem. It's, it's much, much more difficult. And I mean, any of you who has some experience with Turantai problems can probably understand why. And this goal is we want to describe the typical structure an H-free graph. OK, so what, what do I mean by this? Um, let's fix some number n. We fix some vertex set of size n, say 1 through n. And uh, we consider the family f and h. These are all the subgraphs of the complete graph on n vertices, which don't contain, don't contain h. So now, uh, what does the typical structure mean? We draw a graph from this family, a uniform, uniformly at random, and we try to say something about it. But actually, what, <coughs> what the method will allow us to do is to introduce another parameter, m, and consider the family F and MH, which is a subfamily containing, consisting only of graphs which have precisely M edges. So of course, if we are able to understand this family, then we'll also be able to understand this family j just by, uh, sort of by summing up the, the answers. Yes, Pelek? Like Uniformly, GNM. yes. So it's the same as GNM conditioned on this. I mean, it, this is just some finite collection. You choose one element uniformly at random. <coughs> now, <coughs> the f first observation is that this problem fits into our general framework. Right? We can define a hypergraph H of, uh, this is the hypergraph of copies uh, of our graph H in the following way. So here, it's, it can be somewhat confusing, because the elements that we can add or delete are edges. So the vertices of our hypergraph are actually edges of the complete graph. And the edges of, of this hypergraph, which, are, which correspond to the forbidden subgraphs, for every possible way of embedding the graph H into Kn, we get a constraint. So these are the edge sets. of copies of H in, in Kn.
Now, as in the case of, of Semerdi's theorem, or actually the hypergraph of arithmetic progressions, one can compute all the maximum degrees, and co after computing the maximum degrees, if we check this condition star, sorry, I already erased it, so there is this condition of maximum degrees, which depends on this p. There is the smallest value of p for which these conditions are met. So right now I won't be uh, concerned with computing this, so let's just, let's just fix p of h to be the minimum p such that star holds. And now... Uh, for, f for the triangle, just to have some point of reference, this will be 1 over square root of n. So it's, 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 it's pretty small. Now, so let's, let's, apply, the theor let's apply the theorem. Uh, and we get some description uh, of this family. All right, so corollary of the th of the theorem for this particular h and this value ph uh, what does it say for every a positive epsilon uh, there will exist a positive constant c and a family family s this family S will be a family of, of n-vertex graphs, each having at most C times PH times n choose two edges. Now, we also have these two functions, the function g, which takes any h-free graph and maps it to the small graph, which is a subgraph of it, and also the function f, which takes s and maps it to the collection of n-vertex graphs with at most epsilon times n to vh copies. of h. Why epsilon n to the vh? Because n to the vh is order of the order of magnitude of the total number of copies of a subgraph h in the complete graph. So here, the number of edges of, of this particular h is of the order n to the number of vertices of h. And what is the condition for every g, uh, which doesn't contain h as a subgraph? This g is sandwiched between g of g and f of g of g union g of g. So the most important thing is, is this, this graph has few copies of H. So what, what does this corollary say? I mean, in a sense, if we want to understand this family of F and H, it's enough to understand uh, the family of graphs with few copies of this forbidden subgraph H. Uh, so what, I mean, so somehow maybe it doesn't seem like a simplification because I said we want to understand the family, the graphs with no copy of H, and then we say, okay, so it's enough to understand the, the graphs with few copies of H. Uh, but since this is a counting problem, we're really uh, interested in the bulk of, of the family. Um, let's first consider you know, a lower bound on, on f and h. And everything which is much smaller than this, this trivial lower bound, we can, just, uh, we can just remove from consideration because it will be a minority. 
So for this, um, let's review the, I mean, I hope every one of you is familiar with this definition. Ex and H is just the maximum number of edges in a graph G which doesn't, which has n vertices and doesn't contain a copy of H. So now, uh, what, is, what is the conclusion from here? Well, first of all, uh, f and h is clearly uh, at least 2 to the power e x and h, because every subgraph of this maximum graph is, is also h-free. But more generally, f and m of h is at least e x and h choose m. Any subgraph of this maximum graph with m edges is, is clearly h free. Yes, I'm so <laughs> yes, yes, I'm I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah this is like it's, it's, it's the opposite, it's quite the opposite. Uh, it's yes, it's it it's, I, it's it should be yeah it should be called I. Yes, I'm sorry, it's a really bad notation. Somehow this is the standard notation. I'm, I'm very, very sorry for that. I, I should have thought about it. But maybe now if I, if I change it, then I will keep confusing it. Uh, so now we have this lower bound. And uh, together with this, what does it tell, tell us? Well, if, if we look at uh, any of these f of g of g, so f of s, if this f of s, so if f of s, has fewer than e x and h minus the logarithm of the size of its edges, then um, all subsets, all subgraphs of f of s, of all such f of s, are a negligible proportion. Of F and H. Now it may be even for for all such for all of these containers F of S, maybe all of their subgraphs are H free, but even if then their num if if this F of S doesn't have close to the extremal number of edges, then there's so few of them that we don't really have to bother counting because we're only interested in the behavior of the majority. So, so, so S is just some element of this family of this family S. So one of these labeling graphs. So let me let me say again. So the crucial thing is that we have this covering with few sets, which means that this f logarithm here is small. Now we know that every every h free graph will be contained in one of these f of s. So I, I'm only trying to convince you that we really have to understand these f of s which have close to the extremal number of edges. Because we have a lower bound on f n of h. We can take all subgraphs of an extremal graph. So the ones which are forced to be contained in, in, s in small containers are so small that we can completely neglect them. And therefore focus now only on understanding graphs which have few copies of h and close to the extremal number of edges. And this is a much, much sort of more manageable task because we can use all sorts of uh, results from extremal graph theory to, to say actually something meaningful about such graphs f of s. So is, is this, uh, sort of is the idea of how to proceed clear? OK, so let me. Uh, let me start with the first, first such result. So what do we know about h free graphs which have almost the extremal number of edges? So here comes a famous the famous stability theorem of Erdes and Shimonovic. Let me state it maybe in a fuller form. So first there was the theorem of Turan, then Erder Stone, uh, 
and Elder Shimonovich So first of all, for every eight, um, the extremal number of h is dictated by the chromatic number of h. And here may be one more remark why we only reduce so restrict our consideration to graphs uh, with chromatic number at least three, because if uh, chi of h is, is two, then this doesn't really say, tell us anything. Minus. 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 minus, yes, sorry. Yeah, so now, if uh, chi of h is equal to <laughs> then this doesn't tell us anything. Uh, and moreover, uh, for so this is the interesting part, for every delta positive, there is uh, a positive epsilon uh, such that every H3 graph G, uh, which contains at least the extremal number of edges minus Epsilon n squared may be made chi h minus one partite by deleting at most delta n squared edges. Okay, so if we know uh, from, I mean, it's not from Turan's theorem, but one way to construct a large H3 graph is to partition the vertex set into chi H minus one pieces and put all the edges in between. This establishes the, the lower bound here. So first the theorem says that actually one cannot do much better. That's one. But second of all, if one wants to get close to the optimum, necessarily the graph that achieves it must, must be close to this construction. So this is, in fact, the only way uh, to create a large H3 graph. So it's almost, it's almost what we need, uh, but we, we want to know that maybe a similar statement holds not, o not necessarily for H3 graphs, but for graphs with few copies of H. So here, what about graphs with few copies of H. So uh, the first statement that maybe s some of you or even most of you know is the famous supersaturation theorem of Erdős and Shimonovich, which says that if a graph has significantly more than then this number of edges, if I replace this little of one by some fixed epsilon, then I already get the, the maximum count of, uh, of copies of H. So let me, let me write it down and prove it for you. It's a theorem of Erdes and Shimonovich. Uh, says, which says that for every H, and positive delta, there exists some positive epsilon uh, such that any graph G with where the number of edges of G is at least EX and H plus a delta n squared contains at least epsilon times n to vh copies of h. So let's 
maybe sketch the proof. I mean, the proof is almost identical, but much, much easier than the proof of uh, a similar statement for arithmetic progressions. So take such g and let m be about 1 over delta. Now choose uh, R, which is a uniform random subset of the vertex set of G. So the idea is that, um, so surely G contains one copy of H because the number of edges exceeds the uh, extremal number. But actually, if I choose a random subset, then with positive probability, this random subset will also have more edges than the extreme number for m, and therefore I find a copy of h there, uh, and then I'll do some double counting or averaging, and uh, I will get that actually it contains many. So uh, with probability, say at least uh, delta over 2, the number of edges that g induces in r exceeds extremal number of mh. So this is a, a fairly easy computation. And therefore, in whenever r is such, then g of r contains a copy of h by definition of this number. Hence, the expected number of copies of h in g of r is at least delta over 2. But there's another way to compute this expectation, just by using linearity. For every possible embedding of, for every possible copy of H in the graph G, what's the probability that it survives this random selection? So this is more or less the number of copies of H in G times well, the first vertex needs to survive, so m over n, m minus 1, n minus 1, m minus vh plus 1, divided by n minus v of h plus 1. This is about the number of copies times m over n to v of h. And for all purposes here, m is a constant. m depends only on delta, and we get, uh, we get the claim bound. OK, so this tells us that uh, in our characterization, uh, all these sets f of s do not contain uh, more than this number of, of edges. Uh, but Actually, we would like to say something more. We would like to say that if they contain close to this number of edges, then they have to be almost chi h minus 1 partite. So for triangle, if uh, we want to know that for every such graph, which is in this collection, if it contains close to n squared over 4 edges, then it is almost bipartite. And why would such a statement be, uh, be useful? So we disregard these uh, covering graphs, which contain fewer than this number of edges. And if we know that uh, f each one which contains more than that is close to bipartite, then a typical subset of it will also be close to bipartite, which would then mean that the typical triangle-free graph is almost bipartite. And that's, yeah, th this is the whole philosophy. Yes. So this, no, so this is actually an equality here. Uh, and why is this true? So, th so th the reason I chose m to be about 1 over delta, it's somehow it's, it's, a, it's a little delicate, uh, because uh, you're comparing n choose 2 times 1 minus 1 over chi h minus 1 plus uh, plus delta, 
are 2, uh, 1 minus 1 over chi of h minus 1. Uh, m choose 2. Uh, I mean, the, uh, so the, the idea here is that, so you look at the graph, right, and then you count for what's, what says the density is smaller than that. And uh, so the worst, the worst case scenario is when so, some of the time you get the complete graph on m vertices, and uh, all the other time you get something which is just below this, this extremal number. And you can't take uh, m to be s sufficiently small because of this ratio of, of n choose 2 and, and m choose 2. Uh, but I mean, I, ca I can do the computation if you want, but it will, it will take some time. But it's, it's, not, it's not very difficult. So, so here we just show that with probability at least delta over 2 in this worst case scenario, uh, you get more than, uh, than the extremal number for m edges. OK, so now maybe the goal for the remainder of, of this hour is I want to convince you that uh, this stability theorem of, of Erdős and Shimonovich holds in a stronger sense. So the stability theorem tells me that any triangle-free graph which contains almost as many edges as the complete bipartite graph and doesn't contain a triangle must be close to bipartite. And now I want to say that every graph on n vertices, which has as many, uh, almost as many edges as the complete bipartite graph, uh, and contains few copies of the triangle, is necessarily close to, to bipartite. Or in other words, it's either close to bipartite, or it contains many copies of the triangle. So such a statement can be derived from this using the so-called triangle removal lemma, which Ehud mentioned last week. Uh, so what does the triangle removal lemma say? So theorem, which is the triangle removal lemma, due to Ruja and Semeredi uh, it says that if an n vertex G has little o of n cubed triangles then it can be made triangle free by removing little o n squared edges. Now, uh, a corollary, any <coughs> g with n vertices and uh, e x n h minus little o n squared edges is either uh, close, can e maybe can either be made bipartite by removing little o n squared uh, oh, K3. Thank you, Nati. So now any G with N vertices, which is close to this extremal number of edges, can either be made bipartite by removing some small fraction of the edges, or it contains cubically many triangles. And such a statement will remain true if I replace K3 by H and bipartite by k chi h minus 1 partite, I will just use a generalization of this. So such statement is true for an arbitrary graph h. Uh, so either 
it contains the f if it doesn't contain the full count of the copies of H, less than N to V of H, then I, I can remove a tiny proportion of the edges to make it, uh, make it H free. Now proof, so t uh, yes, so tiny is always little o of n squared, but here tiny means little o of the full count in the complete graph. It does, yeah. So it follows from the removal lemma and from the stability. No, no, I'm saying even the removal lemma doesn't it follow from these. And f from from which? From, from the two theorems in the left corner. And no, no. So the removal lemma is actually, if, if, you know, it's a, it's a very powerful theorem because the removal lemma. I mean, an easy corollary of the removal lemma is Semmerdi's theorem for three-term arithmetic progressions. So. Uh, I mean, the typical proof of the removal lemma would use Semredi's regularity lemma. Uh, there are other proofs. There's a recent proof of Jacob Fox, uh, which gives some, the, some of the problem with the removal lemma is that, <coughs> you know, I, I, I hit some constants here in this little o, and um, the dependence between these constants, it's, it's really, really bad. So, you know, if I want to be able to make uh, this graph triangle free by removing, say, delta n squared edges, <coughs> then the number of triangles which I allow is, is such a small constant of delta. It's like, I know, it's a, it has a tower dependence on 1 over delta, say 2, you know, 1 over a tower of height polynomial in, in 1 over delta. Uh, so so it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult theorem. But indeed, this corollary easily follows from the removal lemma and this stability. <coughs> so, <coughs> why? I want to prove that either this holds or that holds. So, suppose I have few triangles. Right? So, suppose that G has little o of n cubed triangles. Then, I use the removal lemma and I remove little o n squared edges to make it triangle free. Now, but I started with the extremal minus little o of n squared edges. I removed further li little o of n squared, so I still have extremal minus little o of n squared. So still have ex n k3 minus o n squared edges left but no triangles. Since I have no triangles, then by stability, I'm almost bipartite. But now the difference between you know, th this new graph and the original graph is, is just little o n squared, so I have to delete twice little o n squared to get to bipartite. So this, this completes the proof. Now, uh, since I only have seven minutes left, actually there's, there's one thing I wanted to discuss here, which refers to, to Tom's question, is that, I mean, this dependence here is, is really, really bad. Uh, and somehow, uh, we would like to know that this characterization of uh, of a, a typical H3 graph that I wanted to prove, I mean, if, if you rely on this particular proof of it, then this would be true only for massive, massive values of n. And, I mean, there's no reason to believe that this is really necessary. So, in fact, at least when in the case when this forbidden graph H is a clique, there are proofs of this statement which uh, circumvent the use of of the removal lemma. And one such proof was given recently by, uh, well, it's a long list of authors, by Yoshi Balog, Neil Busho, uh, Mauricio Colares Neto, Ong Liu, uh, Rob Morris, and Mariam Sh Sharif Zadeh. And the proof, uh, somehow th this statement is proved directly uh, using a very, very elegant argument due to Zoltan Furedi. Uh, which proves erdos Shimonovich stability lemma. I wanted to, maybe in the remaining seven minutes, I want to present to you this argument. It's something that, yeah, it's, it's just a very, very cute argument. 
So what is the statement? It's a theorem. Uh, this is the stability theorem of Erdős and Shimonovich. With pr uh, a proof given by Zoltan. So suppose G doesn't contain, say, let's only prove it for triangles. Uh, and the number of edges of G uh, is at least, or is actually equal to the extremal number for the triangle minus, minus T. Then G contains a bipartite subgraph with E of G with at least E of G minus T edges. Same constant, yeah. So it's the, the argument is, I think it's, it's really, really beautiful. Yes, so actually if you replace triangle by a clique, still the same, uh, it, would, it holds with the same constant. So actually, I mean, I'm going to only prove the triangle because uh, the proof for the clique is, is a bit more involved. It's, it's an induction, uh, but, but it's true. So here I, I need to change it to R apartheid. Now proof, R equals three. This is due to Zoltan Furedi. Excuse me? Uh, R equals 2, yes. <coughs> Thanks. Uh, so let V be the vertex with maximum degree. Let's look at V. Now, let's look at the neighborhood of V. Say, denoted by delta. Now, this graph is triangle free. So I see no edges here in this neighborhood. This is empty. Now, it has delta, uh, it has delta elements. So let's look at the remaining n minus delta vertices. Among them, there's v. So every edge in this graph has to touch this set, because there are no edges that are completely contained in here. OK, say let, let's denote this set by A and this set by B. B is just the neighborhood of, of V. And A is the complement of B. Now, let's count the degrees, uh, the degree sum in A. Sum over all W in A, the degree of W. Now, uh, what, does it, what do I get? Well, if an edge stays within A, I count it twice. If it leaves A, I count it only once. So this is equal to twice the edges of A plus the edges between A and B. Now, uh, on the other hand, I know that V was the maximum degree vertex. So no vertex in A has more than delta neighbors. So this is at most the number of such vertices, which is n minus delta, times delta. Now, this is just the number of edges in a, a bipartite graph, complete bipartite graph of sizes delta n minus delta. And the Turan number is the largest such, such graph. So this is at most ex n k3. Now, what do I get here? It's the uh, number of edges of G plus, plus E of A. Uh, but the number of edges of G, we assume that it's exactly equal to, to E x to the extremal number minus T. which means that the number of edges in A is at most T. But now, if I delete the edges in A, then 
I will have just the complete, sorry, the bipartite graph between A and B. So it's, I think it's a really, really beautiful argument. It's essentially the, yeah, the, the same idea, but s somehow it's surprisingly also, it's, it's really amenable to induction and you can prove it for, for every, it's really, really nice. Okay, I think I'll, I'll stop here for today. <laughs>